Uh, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Tracy Murphy. Tracy is the Director of R&D and Quality Control here at ICT, where she's responsible for the manufacture and QC of ICT's entire product catalog. And today, Tracy is going to be going over some solutions to detect mitochondrial membrane potential and ICT's MitoPT assay kits. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tracy. Thanks, Jackie. And thank you to all of our listeners who are taking t time out of their day today to tune in. Uh, before we get into today's webinar topic, I'd like to take a quick moment to share with our listeners a little background information on our company. Immunochemistry Technologies, or ICT as we're often called, is a privately owned company. We incorporated in 1994, and at that time our focus was on providing custom lab services on a contract basis. Some of the services we offered early on included immunoassay design and development, antibody purification and conjugation services, and custom lyophilization services. Because of these roots and the fact that originally so much of the work we did involved antibodies and immunoassays, we named our company Immunochemistry Technologies, a name that really helped underscore the high level of understanding of our company's founders for the molecular mechanisms underlying the function of the immune system especially the nature of antibody-antigen interactions and the application of that knowledge to a broad range of projects. Over time, as we worked on more and more of these custom service projects, where we were tasked with addressing common immunoassay design challenges, things like nonspecific binding and matrix effects, our ELISA Solutions line of products sort of grew out of this and began to take shape. Today, we offer this line of consumable buffers and reagents as one of our major product categories. And this includes everything needed to run in ELISA, including coding buffers, blocking buffers, sample and assay diluents, conjugate stabilizers, substrates, and stop solutions. Many of these products have widespread utility across a range of immunoassay platforms. Over the years, ICT has also expanded heavily into another product category, cell permeant fluorescent probes. These fall under our cell status indicator product umbrella and are used for monitoring a wide range of intracellular parameters. One well-known example is our fluorescent labeled inhibitors of caspases, or FLICA kits, which are widely used for apoptosis and other caspase detection applications. We also manufacture a set of cathepsin substrate kits, serine protease detection kits, cytotoxicity, necrosis versus apoptosis, and anexin assay kits, as well as many others including some new kits we've added to detect intracellular levels of oxidative stress-related indicators, such as GSH and ROS, and we have many more of these types of products in the pipeline. However, for the purposes of this talk today, the focus will be on our mitochondrial membrane potential probes, or MitoPT products, which are used to monitor mitochondrial polarization. So here, here's an outline of how this talk today will be structured. I'll begin with a brief discussion on the structure and function of mitochondria, followed by an overview of the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, in which we'll see that mitochondria play a key role. After that, I'll move on to a discussion of mitochondrial membrane potential dyes, and we'll see how these dyes can be used to detect cellular stress and apoptosis, and we'll touch on some of the considerations and possible challenges when using these types of dyes for this purpose. And finally, I'll finish by highlighting a few assay kits manufactured by ICT for mitochondrial membrane potential detection, including our MitoPT, TMRE, TMRM, and JC1 kits. So here is a schematic. Um, before delving into this topic further, I thought it would be helpful for us to review this, the structure of a mitochondrion. The important thing to note here is that it is made up of two membranes, an inner and outer membrane, both of which consist of phospholipid bilayers. The space between these two phospholipid bilayers is called the intermembrane space, and this is notably the home or the location of cytochrome C, which we'll see in a minute is important in the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. The volume or the space located inside the inner mitochondrial membrane is known as the matrix and this is depicted as the yellow region in this figure. And the invaginations or folds of the inner membrane into the matrix are known as cristae. Finally, this picture shows a granule, which contains ions, 
and these are believed to be involved in the ionic balance of the mitochondrion. This is a depiction of the electron transport chain, or ETC as it's often called, which is located in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The ETC consists of a series of compounds that transfer electrons from electron donors to electron acceptors via oxidation reduction or redox reactions and couples this electron transfer with the transfer of protons in the form of hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane. This creates an electrochemical proton gradient that drives the synthesis of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, which is the cell's molecular unit of energy currency. This entire process is called oxidative phosphorylation, since ADP is phosphorylated to ATP using the energy of hydrogen oxidation. I included the second schematic of the electron transport chain because I think it does a nice job of illustrating its location within the inner membrane of the mitochondria. As in the previous slide, this figure shows how this results in the creation of an electrochemical proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane by the pumping of protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. And this is depicted as the blue region in the middle of the diagram. And we see that there is a high concentration of hydrogen ions here. On the right-hand side of the figure, inside the red oval, you'll notice the symbol psi m, designating mitochondrial transmembrane potential, which is this charge or electrical gradient. And we see again how this is being harnessed as a power source driving ATP synthesis. The molecule depicted in red shown here is TMRM, which is one of ICT's mitochondrial membrane potential dyes that we'll be discussing in more detail later on in this talk. So this is showing how this membrane permeant dye moves across the inner membrane of the mitochondria as a result of this charge gradient where it fluoresces upon excitation. Depolarized or inactive mitochondria have decreased membrane potential and fail to sequester dyes such as TMRM, resulting in a measurable drop in fluorescent signal, which can then be easily measured by flow cytometry or fluorescence microscope or plate reader. This slide shows an overview of the extrinsic and intrinsic apoptotic pathways. The extrinsic pathway is depicted on the left. It is typically activated by death receptor ligands like FAST ligand or FAST-L as it's pictured here. These bind to receptors at the surface of the cell, which in turn cluster and activate caspase 8. Active caspase 8 then goes on and cleaves caspases 3 and 7, bringing about rapid, apot or rapid cell death. I'm not really going to talk much about the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Today we're going to focus more on the intrinsic pathway, which is also known as the mitochondrial pathway, which is depicted on the right. This pathway is activated by one of numerous cell stresses, such as DNA damage, which leads to mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization and the release of proteins such as SMAC. SMAC stands for second mitochondria-derived activator of caspases and cytochrome C. In the case of cytochrome C, it then goes on to bind the cytosolic adapter molecule, APAF1, or apoptosis activating factor 1, which facilitates formation of the apoptosome. Once formed, the apoptosome can then recruit and activate the, the inactive procaspase 9. Once caspase 9 has been activated, this initiator caspase can then activate effector caspases, such as caspases 3 and 7, which then go on to cleave hundreds of different proteins, bringing about apoptotic cell death. On the other hand, getting back to these SMAC proteins mentioned earlier, these type of proteins function to activate apoptosis by binding to a family of functionally and structurally related proteins that normally inhibit apoptosis called IAPs, thereby deactivating them and preventing them from arresting the process. Therefore, the net result from this is that apoptosis is allowed to proceed. At this point in our, our discussion, I think it would be helpful to go over some basic terms as they relate to mitochondrial function. So first we have mitochondrial membrane potential, delta psi m, which we already discussed briefly on a previous slide. Remember, this refers to the charge or electrical potential, or in other words, the voltage difference between the two sides of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Mitochondrial membrane potential provides the charge gradient required for things like sequestering calcium and for regulated reactive oxygen species, or ROS generation, 
and thus is a central regulator of cell health. Next, we have mitochondrial pH gradient, delta pHm, and this is the difference in the activities, which are often approximated as concentrations of the hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane. In other words, this is a chemical or concentration gradient of protons across the inner membrane. Last, we have electrochemical proton motive force, delta P, which is the total force driving protons into the mitochondria across the inner membrane. So it's important to note that this is a combination of both the mitochondrial membrane potential and the mitochondrial pH gradient. Or in other words, it's a combination of both the charge and concentration gradients. This provides the bioenergetics driving force for ATP production. A key point is that the probes we will be discussing are used to measure mitochondrial membrane potential or the charge gradient. They do not and cannot specifically measure mitochondrial proton concentration or the pH gradient. Now that we've reviewed the structure and function of the mitochondria and gone over some of the basic terms, let's move on to the question, why is mitochondrial membrane potential important? Why would anyone be interested in measuring this? Well, as we've already discussed, it's critical for the maintenance of the physiological function of the respiratory chain in order to generate ATP. Therefore, a significant and sustained decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential will result in the cell becoming depleted of energy, and ultimately this causes death of the cell. A decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential is also implicated during cellular stress. During periods of cellular stress, dysregulation of intracellular ionic charges can result in alterations in mitochondrial membrane potential. And ultimately, if this surpasses the, abil the ability of the mitochondria to buffer these changes, this will lead to a failure of ATP production and bioenergetic stress, bringing about death of the cell. Moreover, there appears to be a feedback mechanism that results in the generation of reactive oxygen species, which further accelerates the rate of cell death. Finally, mitochondrial dysfunction has been implicated in the pathophysiology of many diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Therefore, mitochondria remain an important organelle of study, and in, indeed the ability to determine mitochondrial membrane potential can provide important clues on the health status of the cell, and of course on the function of the mitochondria. This is an overview on some of the dyes commercially available for measuring mitochondrial membrane potential. Some of these dyes include JC1, TMRE, TMRM, RODE123, and DIOC6. Under our MitoPT product line, ICT currently manufactures JC1, TMRE, and TMRM kits. Some common features that you'll find with these types of dyes is that they are cell permeant, lipophilic, positively charged or cationic molecules that naturally accumulate within mitochondria in inverse proportion to the mitochondrial membrane potential according to the Nernst equation. Therefore, the net result of this is that more polarized or hyperpolarized mitochondria where the interior is more negative will accumulate more cationic dye. In the opposite way, depolarized mitochondria, where the interior is less negative, will accumulate less dye. The fluorescence of the dye is then detected by microscopy, flow cytometry, or with a fluorescence plate reader. This allows for qualitative or comparative assessment of mitochondrial memory potential among various experimental conditions. Dye selection is an important consideration when planning any experiment to measure mitochondrial memory potential. Some of the things to consider when selecting a dye include the rate of dye equilibration across the mitochondria, the degree of binding to the mitochondria, the amount of inhibition of the ETC, as well as the type of experiment being run and the concentration of dye being used. In the next couple slides, we'll discuss these last two parameters in a bit more detail. The types of experiments in which mitochondrial membrane potential dyes are commonly used will generally fall into one of two general broad classes or categories. In the first, chronic type experiments, these are situations where the investigator wants to determine how mitochondrial membrane potential changes following chronic experimental treatment of cells or tissues. For example, when an analyzing the effects of chronic toxin exposure 
or the effects of knocked in or knocked out genes on mitochondrial membrane potential within a cell population. In the second, acute type experiments, these are situations where the investigator wants to monitor real time or rapid short term changes in mitochondrial membrane potential in response to acute application of an experimental treatment. For example, when investigating the immediate localized effects of drug or toxic treatments on, on mitochondrial membrane potential. One advantage in these types of experiments is that they allow the sample or condition to serve as its own internal baseline or control, which can make interpretation of the resulting data somewhat easier or more straightforward. For chronic experiments, this can sometimes make interpretation more challenging. Some of the variables to consider that could impact the concentration of dye loaded into mitochondria, independent of a change in mitochondrial membrane potential, include the concentration of dye bathing the cells, the mitochondrial size or mass, and the loading time. For example, if the experimental treatment causes a change in the mitochondrial size or mass, this will alter the surface to volume ratios of the mitochondria. This, in turn, may cause an alteration of the dye concentration and therefore the fluorescence measured may be different than what you would measure based solely on a change in mitochondrial membrane potential. I mentioned this just to give you an idea as these are some of the things that need to be considered and controlled for in this chronic type of experimental design. Within the two different experimental design categories, chronic or acute, mitochondrial membrane potential dyes can also be used in what are commonly thought of as two different methods or modes. The first is the comparative loading or non-quenching mode pictured in the top section of the slide. This typically involves lower probe concentrations, maybe on the order of 0.5 to 30 nanomolar, such that dye aggregation and quenching in the mitochondria does not occur. Therefore, depolarized or less negative mitochondria will have lower dye concentrations and lower fluorescence, and hyperpolarized or more negative mitochondria will have higher dye concentrations and fluorescence. This mode lends itself to acute type experiments where the dye is preloaded and then the experimental manipulations are performed subsequently, or it also works well in chronic type experiments in which the treatments are performed before dye loading in order to make a static comparison of the pre-existing mitochondrial polarization present in control samples and those that received the experimental treatment. In the second mode, pictured in the bottom half of this slide, known as quenching mode, typically higher dye concentrations are used, maybe 50 to 100 up to several micro, 50 to 100 nanomolar up to several micromolar, such that the dye is accumulated within the mitochondria in sufficient concentration to form aggregates, thus quenching some of the emissions of the aggregated dye. And so under these conditions, once dye has been loaded into mitochondria, a subsequent depolarization will result in release of the dye, thus unquenching the loaded probe, and then therefore transiently increasing the fluorescent signal. Of course, under continued depolarization, once all probe in the mitochondria is unquenched, fluorescent signal will decline as dye continues to leave the mitochondria and exits the cell. In the opposite way, subsequent mitochondrial hyperpolarization will result in more dye entering mitochondria, causing further quenching and thus a relative decrease in fluorescent signal. It's important to note that quenching is not a linear event. Therefore, quenching mode can really only be used effectively for monitoring the dynamic or acute effects of experimental treatments on mitochondrial membrane potential after the dye has been preloaded into the cells. Therefore, quenching mode is appropriate for rapid and robust changes in mitochondrial membrane potential that occur during the imaging or analysis period. For slower mitochondrial membrane potential changes in real time, or for determining differences in mitochondrial membrane potential between populations after an experimental treatment, non-quenching mode would be a better fit. I'd like to shift gears for a minute to talk about one of the ways mitochondrial membrane depolarization can be induced. In our lab, we typically will use starosporin, which induces apoptosis, or we'll use one of the proton gradient uncoupling agents, such as carbonyl cyanide M-chlorophenylhydrazone, or CCCP. CCCP is a potent uncoupler of the proton gradient. 
it acts essentially as a hydrogen ion ionophore, which is a substance that transports ions across a lipid membrane in a cell. The protonated form, pictured with the red ionizable proton in the lower right, can diffuse from the intermembrane space towards the matrix, helping eliminate the pH differential as it does so. On arrival, it releases its proton to become the lipid-soluble anion form, which then immediately recrosses the membrane, thereby destroying the membrane potential as it does so. This process can then be repeated again and again, and each CCCP molecule can do this literally thousands of times per second. And so, as you can imagine, this leads to the complete dissipation of both the electrical and the pH gradients in a very short span of time. CCCP is included in ICT's MitoPT products for generating a positive control. As part of our discussion, I'd like to go over an experiment performed in our lab that was designed to measure CCCP potency as it relates to the concentration and the duration of exposure time necessary for inducing a depolarization response. For this study, jerkat cells were grown in normal culture medium at a healthy concentration, then stained with TMRE to detect mitochondrial membrane polarization, and then exposed to various concentrations of CCCP, 0, 5, 15, 30, or 50 micromolar. Samples were read after 5, 15, 30, and 60 minutes exposure to the uncoupling agent. This slide shows data in jerkat cells treated with a relatively low dose, 5 micromolar CCCP. Mitochond mitochondrial membrane depolarization was monitored over time using a flow cytometer. The first histogram plot in the top left corner shows the untreated control. More than 90% of the cells stained positive for TMRE, indicating the mitochondrial membranes of the cells were polarized, and the population shown here was in good health status. 9.6% of the cells were depolarized, which is a pretty typical amount uh, for jerkat cells in a healthy control sample. The plot just to the right shows cells that were treated with 5 micromolar CCCP for 5 minutes. The proportion of depolarized cells nearly tripled to 27.6%. Moving to the next plot, after 15 minutes, 65% of the cells were depolarized. The last plot in the top row shows cells after 30 minutes. In this sample, more than 75% of the cells had become depolarized. The proportion of depolarized cells leveled off after that, remaining relatively constant between the 30 and 60 minute time points. The last plot shows an overlay of the various samples, and we see that the pink and green lines, which represent the 30 and 60 minute samples, are difficult to distinguish as they're pretty much right on top of one another. This slide shows jerkat cells in the same experiment that were treated, this time with a higher dose of CCCP, 15 micromolar, which is three times more uncoupling reagent than the cells on the previous slide. The first histogram plot in the upper left corner shows the untreated control. As before, more than 90% of the cells stained positive for TMRE, indicating the mitochondrial membranes of the cells were polarized and the population was in good health. The plot just to the right shows cells treat that were treated with 15 micromolar CCCP for five minutes. At this higher dose, the cells were essentially completely depolarized after just five minutes. They remained depolarized throughout the rest of the time points. Higher concentrations of CCCP 30 and 50 micromolar showed a similar response, producing nearly complete depolarization of mitochondrial membranes after just five minutes. As you can see, CCCP is a potent proton pump uncoupler, and it's used as a highly effective means for generating a positive control for mitochondrial membrane depolarization. In this next series of slides, I'd like to go over some additional information and also provide some sample data for the products ICT manufactures for monitoring mitochondrial membrane potential. So here we have a little bit of background information on JC1. This molecule is a lipophilic cationic dye. It has a positive charge and lipophilic solubility, which enable, enables it to be readily membrane permeant and it penetrates living cells. Inside a healthy non-apoptotic cell, JC1 dyes enters the negatively charged mitochondria where it accumulates. As the dye accumulates, it spontaneously forms complexes known as J aggregates, which have an intense red or orange-red fluorescence with a peak emission of 595. 
In contrast, in apoptotic or metabolically stressed cells, there will be fewer bright orange-red fluorescent mitochondria and more dim or non-fluorescent mitochondria. In these cells, JC1 will be primarily distributed throughout the cytosol in its monomeric form, which exhibits a distinctive green fluorescence property with a peak emission at 527. Because of this property, where it shifts from green to red with increasing concentration or aggregation in mitochondria, JC1 allows for dual color and ratiometric semi-quantitative assessment of mitochondrial polarization states. This image shows jerkat cells that were treated with one micromolar starosporin for two hours to induce apoptosis or with DMSO as a negative control, then stained with JC1 for 20 minutes and washed twice. The two cells on the upper and lower left contain mitochondria with polarized inner membranes. You can see the JC1 is concentrated inside the mitochondria by the bright orange fluorescence exhibited. The three cells on the right are apoptotic and contain mitochondria that are in various stages of permeability. The mitochondria have become depolarized and are no longer able to accumulate the JC1 dye. The cells display an increased green fluorescence as the reagent has become dispersed throughout the cytoplasm. This image highlights the dual color fluorescence properties of the JC1 dye. This slide shows some sample flow cytometry data, again in jerkat cells, that were treated with either DMSO, the negative control on the left, or starosporin for three hours, the positive control on the right. Orange fluorescence, FL2, is plotted on the y-axis and green fluorescence, FL1, is plotted on the x-axis. In the healthy negative control sample on the left, we see that the majority of the cells have a relatively large amount of orange fluorescence and can be found in the upper region, which is depicted as P1. There are a few cells in the P2 region below this, but not very many. In the starosporin-treated sample on the right, however, we see that many of the cells have fallen out of the P1 region, and there's been an increase in the number of cells in P2, which has lower orange fluorescence potential. This indicates that there has been a collapse of the mitochondrial membrane potential gradient in these cells as a result of the treatment with starosporin. Moving on to ICT's TMRE and TMRM kits, like JC1, these dyes also display a lipophilic solubility characteristic that allows them to be readily membrane permeant and penetrate living cells. They have a delocalized positive charge throughout their membrane structure, allowing them to redistribute across cell membranes in a voltage-dependent manner. These monochromatic dyes will selectively enter negatively, negatively charged mitochondria in healthy non-apoptotic cells and accumulate where they fluoresce orange upon excitation. In apoptotic or metabolically stressed cells, TMRE and TMRM no longer accumulate inside the mitochondria and instead become more evenly dispersed throughout the cytosol. In this situation, overall cellular fluorescence levels drop dramatically. Therefore, healthy cells fluoresce orange, whereas cells with depolarized mitochondria exhibit lower levels of orange fluorescence. As you can see by looking at the structures of these dyes, TMRE is on the left and TMRM is on the right. They are chemically very similar. TMRE is short for tetramethylrhodamine ethyl ester and TMRM is tetramethylrhodamine methyl ester. The excitation and emission optima of the two dyes are very similar as well. TMRE has a peak excitation at 549 and emission at 574, and TMRM has a peak excitation at 548 and emission at 573. In these data, JERCAT cells were treated with either DMSO as the negative control, and this is pictured in the top panel, or one micromolar starosporin for two hours to induce apoptosis, and this is pictured in the bottom panel. Cells were stained with ICT's MitoPT TMRE at 150 nanomolar for 20 minutes, washed, and differential interference contrast, or DIC, and fluorescence images were then acquired with a photomicroscope. The top set of images show normal, healthy cells containing mitochondria with polarized inner membranes. These cells have concentrated TMRE, which is visible as the bright orange-red fluorescence pictured. 
In the lower image, we see apoptotic cells bearing depolarized mitochondria. These cells are no longer able to concentrate the TMRE reagent, leading to the dramatic reduction in fluorescence intensity. In the lower panel DIC image, we see that there are many cells present, but the fluorescence intensity in these cells is much lower than in the upper panel, showing the healthy negative control sample. This next slide shows the effect of tert-butyl hydroperoxide, TBHP, a known ROS-inducing agent, on levels of intracellular ROS and mitochondrial membrane polarization in a population of GERCAT cells over a period of five hours. In this experiment, cells were preloaded with ICT's total ROS green, or 30 nanomolar TMRE, for one hour, then exposed to 100 micromolar TBHP. Samples were then analyzed by flow cytometry at one-hour intervals over a five-hour period. The top panel of histograms show cells labeled with total ROS green. Upon addition to the sample, this reagent quickly penetrates membrane structures and accumulates within the cells. In the presence of ROS, the, the non-fluorescent total ROS green dye is oxidized by the various ROS molecular forms. Once oxidized, it acquires its green fluorescence properties that enable its detection by flow cytometry as an indicator of the relative level of intracellular ROS activity within the cells. So in these plots, the black line represents the untreated control, and the red line is the cells treated with TBHP. As we can see in the top row, after just one hour, the cells exposed to TBHP show increased levels of intracellular ROS which continue to be measured over the next four hours. The lower panel of histograms show cells labeled with TMRE to detect mitochondrial membrane potential. Once again, the black line represents the untreated cells, and the red line is the cells treated with TBHP. In these cells, we see the, the effect of TBHP on mitochondrial membrane potential takes longer to manifest. After two hours exposure, we see that there is a very small population of depolarized cells beginning to appear, but it takes several additional hours of continued exposure before this population grows to make up the majority of the sample. Therefore, to summarize, exposure to 100 micromolar TBHP induces a rapid and robust increase in intracellular ROS levels in GERCAT cells, but the mitochondria are able to buffer the oxidative stress response of the cell for a period of time. However, with continued exposure, the mitochondria in the cells eventually succumb and depolarize. For our last data slide, I wanted to share some dual color flow cytometry data pairing ICT's MitoPT TMRM kit with our green FLICA polycaspase probe, FAMVAD FMK. One advantage of using a red orange emission monochromatic dye like TMRM for measuring uh, mitochondrial membrane potential is that it can be readily combined with a compatible green fluorochrome for simultaneous detection of two parameters within a sample population. In this particular set of samples, on the left we have the negative control population. These are healthy GERCAT cells that were treated with only a DMSO vehicle as a negative control. Most of these cells are in the upper left quadrant of the plot, indicating a high level of orange fluorescence associated with healthy polarized mitochondria. These cells have minimal green fluorescence, which is plotted along the x-axis, indicating that caspases have not been activated in this population. In the positive control population on the right, these cells were treated with sarosporin, a known apoptosis inducer, and we see that the majority of the cells have shifted to the lower right quadrant. The decrease in orange fluorescence indicates that they have undergone mitochondrial membrane depolarization, and the increase in green fluorescence indicates that caspases have become activated. I'd like to wrap up this talk today with a quick product recap for ICT's MitoPT assay kits. So just to review, some situations where mitochondrial membrane potential is often useful include to assess the health status of a cellular population, to measure a metabolic or apoptotic stress event in the population, or to monitor the effects of a drug or experimental treatment. I would also like to remind our listeners that ICT offers a variety of other cell permeant fluorescent probes. In addition to the mitochondrial membrane potential products covered in today's webinar, 
We also carry numerous other products for the detection of intracellular proteases like caspases, cathepsins, and serine proteases, as well as other cellular status indicator products to measure things like cytotoxicity and oxidative stress. We also offer nuclear stains like Hookst and DAPI, and we carry a number of live dead stains like 7AAD, propidium iodide, and green live dead stain, which are useful to our customers for monitoring necrosis or the live dead status within a cell population. As you can see, we really are a one-stop shop for a whole host of life science tools for monitoring a broad range of cell status indicators and key intracellular parameters. To learn more about our other products or services, please visit our website at immunochemistry.com. Or if you have specific questions, please don't hesitate to contact us directly. You can email us at help at immunochemistry.com. Most questions are answered within a day or for more urgent inquiries, you can give us a call. We always enjoy hearing about how our customers are using our products and helping them troubleshoot their experiments. With that, I'd like to turn things back over to Jackie, who's been fielding uh, listener questions that were submitted throughout today's webinar. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions chatted in, so I'm going to start relaying some of the questions to Tracy. Uh, feel free to keep chatting in your questions. Uh, again, if uh, we aren't able to get to your question at the end here in the time we have left today, uh, we will be following up with you with a detailed technical response uh, you know, within the next couple days here. Uh, but to get started, I'm going to uh, start Relaying some questions, uh, first, uh, Tracy, what do you recommend for generating a positive control? Sure. Um, generation of a positive control for mitochondrial membrane depolarization can be done quite easily. In our lab, we normally will use one micromolar starosporin for three to four hours, which induces apoptosis, or we use a proton pump uncoupling reagent, such as CCCP, which is a highly potent uncoupler, and it can be used to produce a robust depolarization in just a few minutes. We normally use it at 50 micromolar for 30 minutes in our lab, but as we reviewed some data earlier in this webinar, the Jercat cell population was actually completely depolarized after exposure to just 15 micromolar CCCP for only five minutes. Perfect, thank you, Tracy. Um, someone else is wondering what the main difference is between dyes like TMRE and TMRM and JC1. Sure. Uh, from a functional standpoint, TMRE and TMRM and JC1 are, are all very similar. Um, they're all the lipophilic cationic dyes, and they tend to accumulate in polarized mitochondria. Um, but of these dyes, TMRE and TMRM are very closely related, and chemically they're, they're very similar. Uh, TMRE is tetramethylrhodamine ethyl ester, and TMRM is tetramethylrhodamine methyl ester. And these dyes have very similar spectral properties and are considered monochromatic dyes. Uh, they're cell permeant, and they penetrate living cells and enter polarized mitochondria, where they accumulate and fluoresce orange upon excitation. And then in apoptotic cells with depolarized mitochondria, TMRE and TMRM are more dispersed, and therefore overall cellular fluorescence levels are decreased. Uh, JC1 is another lipophilic cationic dye that accumulates in polarized mitochondria, but it differs in that it has that dual fluorescence property. So when dispersed throughout the cytosol, it exhibits a green fluorescence emission, but when aggregated inside healthy polarized mitochondria, it forms what are known as J aggregates, which display a red fluorescence property. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, next question, someone's wondering whether these dyes detect MOMP or MOMP? Sure. Um, the term the customer is referring to, MOMP, um, stands for mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization. And this happens when a BCL2 subclass known as BH3 only proteins become activated. And in turn, this helps activate two proteins known as BAX and BAC. BAX and BAC translocate to the outer membrane of the mitochondria where they orchestrate a process known as MOMP. So the net result of this is that pores are formed in the outer membrane of the mitochondria membrane in integrity is lost, and then the contents of the intermembrane space gain access to the cytosol. One of these is cytochrome C, which we saw when we reviewed the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, complexes with APAF1, 
forming the apoptosome, which activates caspases and brings about apoptotic cell death. So the mitopt dyes discussed today do not specifically detect MOMP, uh, which is often thought of as sort of a point of no return in terms of the cell being destined to die. Uh, mitochondrial membrane potential dyes detect the polarization state of the mitochondria. Depolarization of the charge gradient can certainly occur in a cell population along with MOMP, but it can also occur on its own. And it can sometimes be thought of as more of a transient event or state in that it indicates that the cells are stressed, but they may not always be destined for apoptosis or cell death. For example, if this occurs as a result of DNA damage, it's possible that the DNA may be repaired and the mitochondria may be able to recover. Great, thank you, Tracy. Uh, next question we have here, uh, someone's wondering which of the mitochondrial membrane potential dyes inhibits the ETC the least? Sure. Um, I believe that's TMRM. It inhibits it the least, but however, I should note that in non-quenching experiments where one is using these types of dyes at lower nanomolar levels, uh, binding to the mitochondria and the resulting inhibition of the ETC would be negligible. Great, thank you. Uh, next question we have here, we'll just take a couple more uh, here today. Uh, someone's wondering if we could share some information regarding dye equilibrium rates. Sure. Uh, TMRE and TMRM tend to equilibrate rather quickly, uh, making them these well-suited uh, reagents for non-quenching experiments. Uh, Road 1, 2, 3 is slower to equilibrate as it's less permeant across the plasma membrane. So this is often a good choice for acute quenching studies where the use of a faster equilibrating dye would prove more challenging. Um, JC1 is more slowly permeant. Um, the monomeric form has actually been shown to redistribute on a time scale similar to that of TMRE and TMRM, or about 15 minutes. Uh, but the aggregate can actually take much longer, possibly up to an hour or more in some cell types. Great, thanks. And, you know, I think just for the sake of time for everyone, I'll let them get on with their day. Uh, we're just going to do one more question here. Again, feel free to keep chatting those in right up to the end. Uh, we'll make sure we can uh, get you a personalized technical response afterwards if we don't get to yours. Uh, again, you know, if you also have a question that's more specific to your, you know, specific project, feel free to chat those in as well, and we can get someone to get back to you on that. But uh, the last question we'll take here today, uh, we have a few people wondering whether these mitochondrial membrane potential dyes can be fixed. Oh, this is a good question, and this is a common question that we get. Um, with aldehyde-based fixatives like formaldehyde or paraformaldehyde, these solutions work by cross-linking primary amino groups in proteins with other nearby nitrogen atoms, such as those in nearby proteins or DNA, and this happens through CH2 methylene bridges, um, but this alters the state of the cell or tissue such that the mitochondrial membrane potential would also be disrupted, and the cells would become depolarized as a result of this process. Uh, Alcohol-based uh, fixatives work by denaturing proteins, and these would also be expected to have a deleterious effect on mitochondrial polarization state. Therefore, if someone were to use our MitoPT products in fixed cells, or use them and then subsequently fix the cells, they would find that all of their samples would be depolarized, and therefore they would have a low level of staining as a result of the fixation process itself. So the short answer is no, these kits are not compatible with fixed cells or tissues. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, well, that about wraps up our presentation here today. Uh, again, like I said, if we're unable to get to your question or, you know, I've looked at it and it, it does require a really in-depth technical response from our team, we will follow up with you personally after the webinar. And again, I will be sending out the full recording of this webinar within the next day or so. Uh, the next webinar that we have coming up is scheduled for September 28th and will be on the topic of cytotoxicity. So we'll have our registration details up on our website within the next day or so here, uh, so you can go ahead and register for that webinar on our webinars page very soon. Uh, if you can think of any other questions after the webinar or have ideas for us on future webinars, any topics you're really interested, um, whether you know it's something on our ELISA reagents or on cell viability assays, feel free to let me know. Uh, you can either fill out the Contact Us form on our website, or you can reach out to me through social media, 
Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, anything like that. Uh, thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us, and have a wonderful rest of your day.